Um, I'm, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Deb Nicholson here. Uh, Deb's a free software policy expert and a, a passionate community advocate. Um, she's currently the Director of Community Operations at the Software Freedom Conservancy, and uh, she's formerly served as a Community Outreach Director for OIN. Uh, particularly this year um, at Libre Planet, she won a, uh, the Free Software Award. Yeah, that's it? why it's simple. Yep, it's simple. the Free Software Award, yep. and has previously won the O'Reilly Open Source Award for her work in Media Goblin as well. Um, and so she's here to talk about the Free Software Utopia. Yay! Awesome. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's my first time to Greece and uh, first time to actually buy itself Gladex. So, and everyone's been really great. So uh, this has been really fun so far. Uh, hopefully we won't, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try and keep that going. Uh, this is me on social media and that's the Conservancy. If there are folks that do not know what the Software Freedom Conservancy is, you can look it up, not this minute, but uh, we're going to do a supporters event tomorrow night too. So, um, so as a free software policy advocate, I spend a lot of time thinking about like how to explain why free software matters, um, and you know maybe you all do too. Uh, and for myself, like my background before coming to free software was in political organizing, a lot of like free speech and civil liberties and access to the political process, and then we moved all those conversations to the internet. So. It really matters to me a lot, like not just like in the way that like, oh, you should be able to do what you want with your computer. It's like you should be able to see like what happens behind the scenes and who's pulling the strings on the conversations that we have online. Um, and you know, who's like, why, why is everything uh, kind of geared towards people who have the most money to spend? And it's because of the ads. So that like, I, I I dislike the degradation of the commons in that way. So, uh, so yeah, so those are some of the reasons that I think free software matters. I'm sure you all have your own ideas. Uh, and so then I think like what sort of a movement do we want to build and, um, and why not build a utopia? Like if we're gonna change the whole world and try and make it better, then why not make it awesome, right? Uh, not just like, oh, we have like the same like capitalist hellscape, but with a better license. Like, hmm, it seems like pretty low bar to set for success. Uh, and maybe not something you want to spend like a decade or two of your life doing volunteer work on. Like, you know, uh, so like, let's make it awesome. So utopia is a tricky word though. Like your utopia might not be the same as mine. When I think of utopia, I think of justice and I think of fairness. Um, I also think of like a place where everyone feels respected uh, and where people have uh, enough, you know, enough leeway to feel self-actualized and happy. Um, and, and also like uh, a place where, you know, it sort of feels like everyone is treated with some amount of equality. So like a utopia for like, 10% of the population as not usually a utopia for the other 90%. And that is, that's actually what you would call a dystopia, uh, except for if you're in that 10%. And so, uh, so your utopia might not be the same as mine exactly. Like maybe yours involves more sunshine and mine involves more time inside because I'm too pale for that. You know, so your utopia is gonna be a little different. Um, there's like even, and people like often define their utopia based on what they don't like, like experiences that they've had that have been negative. So there's like a famous early science fiction book called Mizora by Mary E. Bradley. And, um, and it's this, uh, you go up to the Arctic circle and fall in this hole and there's this all women utopia. Uh, and some of the things that were featured in that utopia were like, you get to go to school for free and you don't have to haggle at the marketplace, which is like a really specific kind of utopia. To me, that story kind of tells uh, a lot more about like what sucked during her lifetime than it does about like where we should be looking for utopia. I mean, maybe you like haggling. 
Some people do, some people don't. But uh, you know, it had a lot of it had a lot of things about like what they would like to not see. So some of the things I would like is for people to not have like a a memory of a lot of negative experiences with free software. So that's like one thing that we could change. And some of that's not like our fault in this room. Like we have a lot of other free software communities, but there are definitely other communities that are not making a great first impression. So that's like, it's, it's like not our fault, but it might be something we have to consider. So um, when we think about like building free software, and this has been touched on a little bit already, like we could just build replacements for what already exists. And that would be fine, um, but like you know, like we talked about rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic is maybe not like the awesome society that we want to spend a lot of time building. So we may want to actually just build like totally different things, things that don't exist uh, yet. That you know, not just like it's it's a really difficult sell to say like, oh, try this other operating system. It's missing a few drivers, but. Um, and like the fonts are kind of crummy, but it's, it's good. Not that the fonts are crummy anymore, where that patent finally expired, so we can have nice fonts again in free software. But um, it would be amazing to tell someone, hey, try this new, like this other thing. It's better in these other ways that you never thought of. So, um, so like I'm kind of trying to vision, right? Um, and like proprietary software isn't perfect either. It like leaves us this huge amount of leeway for how we could change things. Like I was sitting on an airplane with a, um, a older couple and they had their iPads and they were supposed to be able to just access all the movies on the plane. You know, and the, it's like the directions on the little seat card said like, turn on your iPad, access movies. Did anyone think it was actually that easy? No, of course not. I had to go into a part of the iPad that like they'd never seen and they were a little worried. They were like, what, what did you say you do again? I'm like, oh, I hack iPads and strangers on the internet. You know, no. But um, it was like, oh, like several different steps and it was non-obvious. If you were like a casual user, you didn't know that part of your iPad existed. And so it was like confusing and the, like this experience where they're like, oh, I feel like I don't understand this thing I own. So proprietary software is not like this like beautiful unicorn, you know, like they like to have you believe like, oh, well, you know, I use, I use proprietary software because the user experience. And it's like, eh, it's not that great. Um, not only that, it's, uh, you know, it's when you start to hit the parts where you're like, why won't it do what I want it to do? That's, I mean, that's the real magic. So, um, so, the one thing that proprietary software does have that we don't have is money, right? Um, so this is like a open source event on the water. You know, we're pretty close to the beach, um, but this is like at a hotel. So like, when you go to a proprietary software event, it's like fancy. Like they kind of set you up with like a lot of stuff, you know, like drink tickets and like, here we bought you a phone for speaking and showing up or whatever. Um, we're not gonna compete on that, I don't think, unless someone here is wealthy and has been holding out. Um, you should see Molly about that if that's the case. <laughs> she's, uh, she's working really hard on development. You could save her a lot of time. Just FYI. Um, but what we could compete on whoops, is, well, that, but um, is, is being awesome and doing a great job mentoring, doing a great job of like kind of passing the torch to the next generation and bringing in new people and making them feel like, yes, I am a rock star. I am now part of the free software movement. So we could be amazing at that. It's like, doesn't cost money, cost time and effort and enthusiasm, which, I'm looking out at this room, I feel like we, we have a lot of that, maybe more than money, which is great. Um, so that, like, that's one of those things where we could beat and exceed proprietary software. But there are, you know, there are a couple things in our way there. Like, I think about like the way the free software movement looks from the outside to the way it feels on the inside. And, um, 
And it's various. It doesn't always match up. Like, you know, sometimes it, it's like, oh, come here. We're, like, building all this awesome, like, freedom. It's going to be this, like, amazing utopia we're building together, maybe. And then you go to the mailing list, and you're like, whoa, we're building the utopia here? Ooh. Uh, I don't know. Like, the inside versus the outside, it's, like, a little bit, like, oh, wait, I thought it was a hotel room. There's no walls. That's, you know. Um, but, like, it, it, the inside versus the outside is, uh, it's, it's tricky. Like, we, we can't, like, tell people, like, come here for the cake, and then they show up, and it's, like, mushy peas. So, um, so that's one of those things that's, like, a little bit tricky. Uh, I don't know if proprietary software is better or worse. They pay people, so maybe they don't complain. I don't know. But, uh, but it's frustrating because I feel like if you do a lot of work to try and bring in new people, it only takes, like, one person to kind of mess it up. You, like, work really hard to get someone to a meeting or an event or a user group thing or something like that. And then, like, one person shows up and is like, I just don't think women should do tech. And you're like, what? Ugh, forget it. That person's never coming back. I just spent a ton of work to get them to come to this meeting. And because we lacked the will to be like, uh, yeah, that person doesn't speak for the room. Bye, go away. Like, you know, it wastes a lot of time. So, um, so I mean... That's like, and, and it only takes one person. That's the thing that's unfortunate. You can have like 99 amazing people at an event, and then one person is just like, oh, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that we tolerate that kind of behavior here. So it's like, it can be really tricky. So you have to do a lot of work to be vigilant on that, which is frustrating. Anyway, so we'll, we'll get off that for a little bit. Um, and on to, like, kind of who we're building it for. So when you think about this, like, utopia, I think it's almost impossible to build a utopia for someone without talking to them first. Like, what are the odds that I would, like, actually get that right? And be like, I made this utopia. Oh, shoot, you're allergic to peanuts. I love peanut butter. I populated it with Reese's Cups. Whoops. So, and the same is true with software. If you're going to build something for someone, then you have to talk to them. You can't be like... Oh, yeah, like, we're talking over here, and you're not allowed to be part of the conversation until we finish this thing we made for you. Um, it's like, uh, there's, there's this story about uh, a play pump that people built in Africa where they, uh, it was humanitarians from outside Africa. They're like, this will be this great thing. We're going to make this thing for people in Africa. And it was like, like this thing you push around. You've seen them on playgrounds. They're supposed to be fun. Um, and the one they made was not fun because it was really hard to push. And then they replaced the existing pumps with that. Um, so, uh, and then they broke and they didn't come out and fix them. So they replaced a working thing with a non-working thing that was not fun and also uh, not able to be replaced. So it was, it's, it, it's tricky. Like, I think of this. I'm like, Oh, we're going to go to Mars for 500 days with no windows. What are the odds of the person that designed that imagined they would be in that rocket ship? 500 days, no windows. Eh, probably not. So if we're going to build stuff for people, we have to talk to them about it. Um, and that probably means having more events where we have more non-technical people. Not just here, but like generally, right? So that's, that's like kind of what I uh, have been thinking about. Um, Another thing that is, like, then how do we treat those people when they show up? I'm from this part of the U.S. called Massachusetts. Um, some of you have heard of it, probably. Um, we're not famous like New York, so we, uh, but when we are famous, it's kind of for being a little bit grumpy, actually. Um, it's cold there. Um, but, and wet, too, so, like, cold plus wet. Um, but I grew up in a place called Maryland, which... This is, uh, there's a huge edit war as it, like, around, like, is Maryland part of the South? So the South has this other reputation of being like, oh, we're friendly and, like, you know, everyone's super nice and it's like the Southern hospitality. Maryland may or may not be part of the South. Uh, Massachusetts is definitely not part of the South. It's way further up. 
like I said, we have this reputation for being pretty grumpy. Um, and, uh, you know, and I thought, like, maybe, like, oh, you know, the South pretends to be nice, but they're not really nice. And Massachusetts is honest. So when people are grumpy, it's like they're being honest. Okay. So, like, I thought about that, like, I thought that way for a while. I was like, somehow, like, grumpy and mean equals honest. And maybe we had that same problem in free software for a while, too. Um, and, I, and I've come around on that. I think it's not good. So another thing that's interesting about Boston, and maybe contributes to the grouchiness, is that not only is it cold and wet, it's actually very hard to navigate. All of the roads, like, if you looked at them aerially, it sort of looks like a big pile of spaghetti that somebody dropped and then kicked and then tripped over and broke a few pieces. Um, and so, so when people come to visit, they're like looking at their phone and like, oh man, what is, the, is this a five-way or a six-way intersection? I can't tell and I don't know which way I'm faced. So, so now I see people downtown and I say, oh hey, can I help you find something? So um, it might feel weird at first, but I would love to see us do more of that in free software. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I also help run a conference called Seagull. So um, I have a lot of pictures of seagulls. And I actually hope that we might get this one day if it wasn't too creepy. I don't know. What do you guys think? Is the seagull creepy or not creepy? OK, OK, OK. <laughs> All right, we'll just keep it as a slide. <laughs> so I, don't, I actually don't know where you can buy this costume anyway. So, um, OK. So, so user experience. Like, so what do we do when they get here? Like, you talk to folks, you say, can I help you find anything? Like, you know, maybe don't wear a creepy seagull costume. And, um, you know, like, I, I can tell y'all are taking notes. No creepy seagull costume. Check. Um, but the user experience, like, sometimes, especially uh, if people are installing stuff on their own machine, uh, the user experience is a little like this. And, uh, and that's not good. Like, you got someone really excited, like, install this thing, and then it, it's just going to work, except uh, it won't connect to the audio, so it won't work. Whoops. Or, you know, or not that. And not to say, you know, it's not, this is not to, like, kind of belabor the shortcomings, but just, like, more to think about, like, who we recommend stuff to when and when we recommend it. Like, we're not doing people a favor for recommending something that's, like, beyond their technical ability. And, and that means sometimes the stuff we're really excited about, it's like, oh, 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 well, tell me a little about like what kind of computer user you are, and then like maybe you should stick with stable and you know that kind of thing. And you know, and there are things that we're a little bit blind to as far as user experience. Like Clarissa gave a great talk earlier about um, her work on user experience stuff, and uh, and it, it's like sometimes it's, it's not intentional. Like, if, you've, if you're this close to something, it's really hard to see, like, what a person who's brand new to it would do and how they would use it. Um, and I, I, actually, the GNOME project is really great about accessibility. So I just want to say, like, yay, keep doing that. Um, it's, to me, it's like this, like, if we can send code to space, we should be able to, you know, make it really easy to resize type. I don't understand. This is another thing that proprietary software doesn't do. They're like, they have code in space too. And it's like, but why can't we have readers? That's ridiculous. Like, because, well, I don't know. Maybe space is paying better money than, uh, than people who need readers. So um, anyway. So uh, you know, we kind of talked about having the loudest person in the room like, be, like kind of ruin the vibe, so to speak. And um, but this is like. So no Nazis is actually like one of those market niches that we could use for free software. <laughs> I'm glad you, I'm glad to have a room full of folks who are enthusiastic for that us exploiting that market niche um, because like you know that's like really like oh can we just have a conversation on the internet with without you know blah. It's like so. Um, so that's like one of those things that we could do that would like kind of like, oh, what's, so what's so much better about your stuff than the stuff I'm already using? And it's like, oh, we don't have any of that poop here. So, you know, we have that going for us. So, so that's one of those things that we, like a niche we could exploit. So 
I want to think a little bit about like, so we talked about like who we're building it for, but who are we building it with? Um, and uh, so when I was at Media Goblin, and Media Goblin is decentralized media hosting, uh, started by me and my friend Chris Weber. Um, and Will Kong Green, but then he got a super sweet job and, and had a baby, so he didn't, he didn't follow us all the way through. Um, and that's great. Like, you know, people should do those things. Uh, but we thought a lot about, like, who we wanted to be in a free software project with. And we intentionally did, like, a lot of our first outreach stuff. We were like, oh, look, it's not all men here. Um, and... Chris, in particular, did this, like, he did all these goblins that, uh, like, no gender, no race. They're all, like, pink and purple and, you know, wearing little kind of, not, you know, like, kind of non-binary French outfits. Like, um, but it was, like, we kind of put this thing out into the universe. Like, everyone is welcome here, regardless of, all, like, who you are. We're just, we're actually very into that. So, and it worked. Like, people came. Um, they heard it. This guy is playing a um, recorder to get raccoons to come. I think he also feeds them, but uh, raccoons don't, <laughs> raccoons like many of us don't naturally like the recorder, but, um, <laughs> but if there's food when you get there, <laughs> they'll come. Uh, and so, uh, so we, we kind of put that out into the world intentionally to say like, hey, you know, um, this is not gonna be a bunch of just white men. Which at the time when we did that, there was a lot of, there was a lot of advertising and some of the like, it was like when GoDaddy was doing some of their really gross advertising with like lipstick and uptime jokes. So, um, so it was kind of specific, it, it, it seemed like, oh, we could, here's like a thing we could definitely improve upon, right? Um, and so like, we put like diversity and inclusion in the center of how we shaped the project and how we did the marketing how we talked about um, how we were going to develop software, who we were including. And so um, we did uh, release notes where we talked about everybody who contributed, not just coders, but people who were doing translation, people who were doing writing, people who were helping us with your experience and stuff like that. So we made sure that that was also like, not just part of our marketing, but also part of our release notes. And we wanted everyone to know that we appreciated them. They were special and awesome for coming and helping us build Media Goblin. And that was like specific all the way through. Like I said, not just, not just folks who were writing code, because it, that can be really tricky. Like, there are definitely other free software communities where I've gone and I'm like, hey, what's up? And I feel like the coders are like over here, like, go away. Um, and it's like, oh, I, I wanted to like, help you blog or write some release notes or something, or actually even just put a sentence on the front page of your website about what the heck this project is. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's this tricky thing where we have, and I think this is another thing that we've gotten kind of from the proprietary software industry because they pay so much for code and like almost nothing for everything else. But if we're going to build a utopia, we don't have to import that. We can just decide that we don't accept that and, and change it. Um, so a little bit more on who we're building it with. Like, if we're going to build a utopia, there can't be missing stairs. Um, and so I'll explain that because I think it's a um, US colloquialism. But a missing stair is a person in the community that other folks warn you about. Uh, and they're like, oh, yeah, that person well, just make sure you're never in a room alone with them. Or don't bring up any number of several common topics because you'll end up having a shouting match with them or some other behavior that would not be accepted but is, like, just warned about. And that, um, it's, a really, it's, it's a really bad way to build a community and get the folks that you actually want in the room. I think many of you probably understand that, but I know we all participate probably in multiple software communities. Uh, and the, the having like a missing stare be the person like in charge of your community or a person that nobody is willing to get rid of, um, yeah, it's kind of like, oh yeah, have a seat, get comfortable. Like, no. Um, the utopia cannot have like a whole bunch of folks that just sort of, we all warn each other about and leave to that behavior. So, um, 
And then this one, I, like, I also think it's, it's interesting that we uh, often in software fetishize the person putting the most hours as well. Like, that's like, you know, I know that's a lot less uh, harsh than the missing stare thing, just so you know, they're not equivalent. But it is really tricky, like, if it's like, oh, I, uh, I, I did so much work that I am going to fall asleep on my face here. And um, it, and it kind of sends this message that we don't care about folks that have, like, a part-time amount of time to contribute to free software. And, you know, if we're going to bring more folks in that are closer to, like, our user land, then having, uh, having it, like, oh, we only care about folks that are willing to, like, do so much time that they, you know, fall asleep at their desk or sleep under their desk. So, um, so it, like, I'm, I'm interested in seeing us, like, no longer fetishize that most hours thing. Because, like, if you picture a utopia, like, there should be time in the hammock, right? Like, there should be time, like, where you're relaxing and not in front of the computer all the time. I don't know. Your, your utopia may vary. Maybe you, you like that. I don't know. Um, I feel like people write better software. They do better work when they have a little bit of balance. So, so if you're going to do that, then you have to, you know, if we want to think more about who we're building it with, that has to be intentional. It has to be a plan. It can be like, oh, I guess we'll just take whoever shows up. Um, it has to, like, if you don't set a goal on where you want to go, then you won't get there. So, um, now we're going to talk about who isn't here yet. So, um, I think Robert mentioned this morning that we have 3% of the market for desktop, right? So, which sounds kind of grim, but, like, that's 97% opportunity, right? Like, we could think of it that way, um, but, uh, but it doesn't mean we have to, you know, we can't only talk to each other. I mean, it is fun to do that, too, but we have to also, you know, go outside a little bit. Um, and, uh, and that means, like, kind of talking to the middle. So there are some folks who are really jazzed about proprietary software. Um, it's, like, generally correlates to how many houses they have a little bit. Probably, very, like, if you have three houses, you own a proprietary software, you might be a little excited about it. Those folks are, we're probably not going to bring them on over and be like, hey, what do you, you know, come on, like, hang out, go out, be at school, and, you know, uh, and that kind of thing. It's, uh, this is one of the things that I learned when I was working in politics, is, uh, so, like, I worked in electoral politics for a few years, and one of the things that is weird about that is that sometimes you go to these professional events with folks from the other side of the aisle. So, like, which you actually have more in common with them in a tactics sense than you do with the folks in the middle who actually don't think about politics at all. So I'm not saying we should, uh, there's definitely some things we're not going to borrow from proprietary software, but the, the idea of talking to people in the middle who haven't decided yet is the key piece there. So there are folks who are like, no, I have, you know, I have stock in several proprietary software companies, I'm good. Or, you know, have written academic papers about, like, why info commies must be stopped or something like that. We're not bringing those people in. Who cares? Forget about them. The other people in the middle, folks who are like, oh, yeah, I use my computer, and sometimes it's really annoying. Like, that's not, like, the most, like, kind of, you know, aggressive statement of all time. But we could work with that because if once they understand that it's really annoying by design and then we have something else that they could use, then we could start to bring them in. So, and some of that means like, you know, like I said, setting the bar higher. And the bar has been set so low for proprietary software. This is a Boeing plane. Uh, they offered software with the plane, but you had to pay extra for the security, or for the safety stuff. And, um, you know, it's a, the bar has been set like, like through the floor for what people expect from software and what they get. So like we could do like so, so much better than that. And part of that means thinking about people as users instead of customers. I think we do like, like uh, GNOME seems to do a very good job of that, and, which is exciting. Um, 
you know, and that, that means we could provide things that are like not for pay. We could provide things people have never seen before. Um, well, someone's seen this because they took this picture, but, um, and uh, it's apparently it's like krill or shrimps in there. Um, anyway, so we could, we could give people things that they haven't seen before, you know, things that, uh, that they don't have to pay for, um, like a paradise, right? So, so we're, you know, where else could we look for folks? Like, so we're thinking of the, like people that are looking for software to use, not software to pay for. Um, I think the kids, and I say this as an old person, I'm definitely this like, hello fellow kids. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm not a kid. Uh, but it's, but we, we need young people in the free software movement. It's like, the world's pretty dark actually. And, you know, not everywhere you look, but a lot of places. Like, we could offer things that are sort of like, here's some hope on this, like, surveillance capitalist hellscape that we have. So it's, you know, we, again, there's a, a market niche, I guess, right, in that, like, oh, you could have software that doesn't spy on you. You could, like, you could use the Internet and not have toilet ads follow you around forever. Have anyone ever bought a toilet seat on the internet? Okay, you don't have to say, all right, all right, all right. So like, if you don't turn on like no script or something, which you have to turn off to do like many things on the internet, you buy a toilet seat and then you get ghosted with toilet ads for like a couple weeks, as if you're maybe a toilet seat collector. Like, I don't know about you, I don't have one of those sweet proprietary software jobs, so we don't have that many toilets. Like we just we use we need one seat like every seven years or so maybe. Like I'm definitely not a collector. So like you know it's like oh yeah the beautiful power of the internet. You can be like ghosted by toilet seats for weeks. Like mm. like again the bar's been set really low and it's sort of like oh like like this it's this tangible thing like the internet knows what you want, and then gives you toilet seats instead. Like, why is that? I mean, we know why that is. It's because like, you can buy them, but there are other things that we might want that we don't buy. Um, and there are other things that like, you know, people in San Francisco like, might want it, but the rest of us don't. Like, uh, like the software industry has this kind of insular bubble thing. There are many, many other people that we could provide amazing software for. That maybe like don't live in a bunk bed in San Francisco. So um, the bunk bed thing is real. One of the other things that I get ads for because I go to technical stuff is um, like a, a little tent to put around your bunk bed in your San Francisco apartment that you share with like six people. So I don't know. Does that sound like the utopia to you? <laughs> to me, the utopia doesn't involve bunk beds. I think there's I think there's good history on that. They, there's no there's I mean for children sure okay but for adults adults in bunk beds like does not sound like utopia to me. So <laughs> it's a uh, but you know it's so I try to think about like the the kind of world that we might we might want to build and um, you know so we <laughs> we've already established that for me it doesn't involve that much sunshine or bunk beds or toilet seat ads. Um, but there are a lot of other things like user respecting, freedom respecting software that like offers something other than just like, oh, it's like proprietary, but less so because the patents like that they have, we can't use that kind of thing. So, so, so that sounds nice, right? I, I mean, we're all here. We spent, you know, we came all the way to Greece to hang out together and think about what we might build together, right? So, what might we build together, if you've been taking notes? So, um, we covered, there, no poop. There are no Nazis in the utopia. And we, got, we, we understand, the whole, the whole room agrees on that, so, so I'm very happy about that. Um, you know, it's, uh, that's, yeah, it's just not negotiable. And, um, and we have to set a goal on that. If we want to build a utopia, then it has to be like an intentional goal. We have to like chart 
a course for that utopia. Um, and no pedestals. We can't have like a thing where people that perform one valuable function in our community and people who perform another valuable function in our community are like put on totally different settings. Um, like we, we can't go to other countries with our software if we don't have anyone who wants to translate it. It's just not gonna happen. Um, and we can't leave the users at sea once they once they install stuff, like, good luck. Um, I think, you know, we do a good job of that here. But like I said, we all participate in multiple communities. And um, I definitely see a lot of like, oh, you should just use this. And it's, it's sometimes free software is not more secure. And so it's not a good recommendation until we fix the security to say like, oh, you should be using this instead. So we're, we're gonna recommend it to folks that has to be ready for them to use it. And then the user experience um, is crucial. We're gonna do some, if, if you wanna participate in user experience stuff, we're gonna do it on Tuesday. Um, I have some projects from, uh, on the settings stuff, but uh, start like, cause I've been saying like, oh, we should be doing user experience stuff. And so a few years ago at Libre Planet, I started doing uh, spinach con, which is when your favorite software has like a little spinach in its teeth and it needs you to tell it like, oh, you got a little, I can't figure out how to exit this program stuck between your teeth. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, the, the idea is that it's like offered in the spirit of friendship as opposed to like, so you spent hours and hours making this thing, but it doesn't do this other thing that I really wanted it to do. Why not? Which is a less helpful spirit to offer user experience feedback in. So we're gonna try and do some of that on Tuesday. Um, and yeah, so the, the licenses are not enough. It's, it's not enough to be like, we have a free software version of the capitalist hellscape. And I like licenses, I like them a lot. I set up a whole conference about copyleft licenses. Um, but it isn't gonna be enough uh, without all of the other things. We have to like talk to the folks that are not already here. And, uh, and make sure that everyone has like a nice experience and good memories of being involved in free software. So, um, picture credits mean that you get to ask questions next. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for coming. So yeah, questions about the free software utopia? Or is everyone done and ready to go out and drink to the free software utopia? If you drink, we're not, we're not encouraging people to. Hey, uh, thanks for your keynote. Uh, my question is, how do we interface the software utopia mm -hmm. with the capitalist, capitalist hellscape elsewhere that demands you have money to live. So, yeah. Mm. Well, you might have to, yeah. Well, all right, so <laughs> in the long-term future, we might have to get rid of capitalism. Yeah, yeah, of course, so, details. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, might. Um, in the short term, like I, you know, like I said, I think we're not going to outspend proprietary software, so I think we'll need more numbers probably, um, both for getting rid of capitalism and proprietary software. Um, and so I think our short-term goal, either way, has to be the numbers, and that means like we have to come on the stuff that we're good at, or or could be good at that doesn't cost money, which is being. Uh, like an amazing place to participate in and an amazing place to you know, like bring new people in and get folks excited about free software. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned the issue of missing stairs where you have someone who you, everybody has to be warned about that you just don't go in a room with them, don't discuss these topics with them. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any suggestions on how to deal with the issue where 
um, one member has history with another member where they are um, sort of the abuser or some sort mm -hmm. and it's the usually that person is fine to be with everybody most of the other people in the community but with a few people or with one particular person they can't be alone mm -hmm. how do you deal with that conflict like it's not you can't deal like the bully right in schools yeah. people do like it's both of your people's fault so both of you sort it out you can't really do that in the real world because one person is the victim and the other person is the abuser so how do you deal with that right any ideas i think you still have to get rid of the abuser because it's likely that uh there are other people who have come to your community before and been like oh nope uh-uh because and you didn't see it and this is actually a common pattern for gendered abuse which is like uh men who are crappy like that they know who they can be crappy in front of. And so they're like, they've, whatever, have learned that. And so if you have only a couple women in your community and one is being abused by a man in your community, they've probably scared off dozens of other women um, before you found out and you noticed and someone decided to stick, a, stick around long enough to be like, hey, I, I feel invested enough to make a complaint as opposed to just leave. So, and, and, and I think a lot of communities have this, it, it seems like a really difficult calculus because they're like, oh, but that person has written like six different libraries and thousands of lines of code. And it's like, oh, but they've scared off like, or, you know, driven out like a dozen people who could have each brought in like three or four friends. And so we now have like, you know, like 60 people or whatever. I forget the math on that, but like lots and lots of people who might have become part of the community, who could have been like not only like a volume ad, but also like bringing it to totally different communities that the software wasn't reaching before. So, um, so it, when you think about like what you're missing out on, when you have one person like that, it's usually they've managed to squick out a whole bunch of other people who have, who left before they bothered to make a. All right, I'll, I'll be around, and so uh, we can, if anyone had a not for the public room question, I can talk to that too. Um, but uh, thanks so much for having me at Guadec. I think Neil's gonna come up here and say some stuff, right? Okay, thank you.